what an exciting day this has been so far and I'm sure we can have a wealth of information to follow. We're gonna understand a little bit first from Helen about NAPA as the, um, and the agency's progress. And then we'll go through an order of the federal updates. You, you may see the order that Helen has dropped in the, the meeting chat. Um, I'll let everybody know in advance, especially the, the new and people, you're gonna to wanna to take a lot of notes, but the slides are gonna be made available to you. So don't, don't worry about that. Usually the posting of all of this material will be on the NAPA website in about a week or so. And so a link to all of these slides will be, be available as PDFs at that time. So let's get started. I'm Helen. Thank you so much, Adrienne. Um, and thanks again to our presenters earlier on today. It's sort of um, out of order. You might have noticed we're doing a little bit of the grounding work right now, um, but we had such a great opportunity to have speakers from Europe that we wanted to recognize um, that and, and appreciate their time. And so um, this is going to be a little bit more level setting presentation, but hopefully you'll have a little more context to understand the presentation that we just had. So Emma, will you start? I think it's start the presentation and go to the next slide. So I'm just going to walk through a little bit of history of NAPA, a little bit of context of where, what has happened before, what's coming um, next, um, what this advisory council does, our national plan to address Alzheimer's disease, broad strokes on the federal infrastructure in which this work is being done, and then turn it over to my agency colleagues to talk about the progress that their agencies have made, both over the last uh 12 plus years that we have been um, doing this work in coordination um, and also in the last quarter and upcoming activities that you all should be aware of. And usually at our quarterly meetings, we do quarterly updates, but we thought for this one, it was important to see the arc of progress um, in this space. So next slide. Um, the National Alzheimer's Project Act, or NAPA, and we will refer to it as NAPA often, um, it's sort of a great shorthand, um, was this very short three-page piece of legislation. Uh, it passed in 2010 and was signed into law early in 2011. It's very straightforward. It requires us to do all of these things, uh, most notably to create and maintain and annually update an integrated national plan to overcome Alzheimer's disease. And the other key piece of this is to create an advisory council to review and comment on the national plan and its implementation, and then to make recommendations to HHS and to Congress on priority actions to address Alzheimer's disease. So it's within this context of NAPA that we are carrying out all of this um, work. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, NAPA was enacted in early 2011, um, and we very quickly, for those of you who have ever seen or stood up another advisory committee, um, acted to stand it up. We had our first meeting in September um, of that year. We released a framework for the National Plan to Address Alzheimer's Disease, saying these are our goals, this is what we expect to do. Received comment back um, on that. We had the first cohort of the Advisory Council make recommendations um, in April of that year, and then in May, uh, turn around and release the first national plan to address Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. And so this is the national plan. This is the cover from 2012. I think 2012 was the only year that we actually printed copies. Uh, it was released at the first national Alzheimer's disease research summit at NIH. Um, and as you can see, there are six goals in our national plan. Up until 2021, we only had five. Um, to prevent and effectively treat Alzheimer's disease by 2025, to optimize care quality and efficiency, to expand supports for people with Alzheimer's disease and their families, enhance public awareness and engagement, track progress and drive improvement. And then in 2021, with the emerging research literature on risk reduction, uh, the call from the field and really a recognition that we needed to start to focus earlier on in the disease progress progression, excuse me, um, and that there was no space in this seemingly comprehensive plan to look at risk reduction. We added a sixth goal focused on um, risk reduction and healthy aging. So it's within the context of these goals that, that HHS um, does its work. HHS and its federal partners, excuse me, does its work. Um, 
So our national plan is updated annually. Underneath each of the six goals, we have strategies to achieve those goals. And then under each of those strategies, we have specific action steps. Um, and those action steps are both work are include the work that we've completed, work that's currently underway, or work that is about to get started. Um, for um, I'm sorry, it says Alzheimer's disease. That's a great question. Um, the NAPA legislation defines Alzheimer's disease as Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. So in the plan language, we use Alzheimer's disease to mean both types of conditions or all of the comprehensive um, conditions. Um, however, I would say more broadly, when we refer to those conditions, we either call them ADRD, we call them in the plan AD slash ADRD um, to be more comprehensive, um, or we might refer to the refer to them as dementia, but by and large, the work is comprehensive of all of the different Alzheimer's disease related um, dementias. Um, and it's only when you get into the really specific research activities that you might see um, a specific type of dementia called out because that is really the focus of that research. But by and large, the work is comprehensive. Um, so the National Plan has said has uh, activities under each goal. It's quite quite expansive. There is a lot of work um, happening. And there's a lot of work that has been happening. Um, and our federal partners sit down every year, look at what recommendations the advisory council has made. Uh, we also hear public comments at every single meeting. And sometimes it might seem like, gosh, these don't go anywhere. But really, we are hearing those public comments. And we have made progress in areas just because of public comments. Uh, we take into account issues in the field or emerging topics more broadly, and then our federal partners notice things through, things through the course of their work and see opportunities and use those to um, create additional actions in the national plan. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to the plan itself, HHS and our federal partners are meeting regularly um, internally and collaborating uh, across different agencies and across different um, topics. I would say we've seen some really great innovations in this space. Um, Initially, in NAPA, we were supposed to identify gaps and overlaps, and there's really not a lot of overlaps um, at all. There's more gaps than there were overlaps, but we've really been able to cover many of the gaps that we've identified through um, pooling resources, leveraging what one agency can do, and then these really great collaborative relationships um, that have, we've maintained over a long time. Um, we have very consistent staff uh, uh, engagement on our advisory council and leadership from the various um, agencies. And when you're in the subcommittee meetings, it might not feel like it because we're trying to understand where the recommendations are coming from, what issues you want to elevate, but know that behind the scenes, the um, folks that are getting this work done and um, highlighting it within the department, within the other federal departments, um, are the people at the table here. I would say that more than almost any other issue that I see in my work, there is coordination on dementia and that there is broad recognition of the vulnerability and the special needs of this population across um, all of the work that we do. Um, and I'd also just say that this has become a model for addressing um, challenging and cross-cutting topics. So not only are the same people convened when it comes to issues broadly related to aging or to disability, or to um, vulnerable populations, um, but folks look to the way that NAPA has been structured, the national plan, and also the input of the advisory committee as a model for the work that we do on other challenging topics. Uh, next slide. And a big part of how we do this is through this federal um, advisory committee. Um, our advisory committee is a little bit unique. There are other agencies with advisory committees that have only public members, but the NAPA legislation required us to have both full public members and full um, federal members. So we have representatives from which we call public members um, with these various different perspectives. Um, and you'll also notice that we try to recognize the various types of dementia in the composition of the public members, um, geographic diversity, et cetera. So trying to get as broad perspectives as possible through our public membership. And then at the federal level, there are specific agencies that were required to be involved in the work that we do that are listed here, but know that we also are talking to colleagues in other departments 
who are doing important work in this space relevant to um, this work and that they are part of our national plan and all of our um, work. Um, next slide. So we have four subcommittees. Um, at the last meeting, someone raised the fact that the breadth and depth of this um, advisory committee is sort of beyond anything that any one else was aware of. And I've really thought about that over the last three months, and it's true. So not only do we cover a broad array of topics that affect research, we'll get into clinical care, long-term services and supports, and risk reduction, we also get quite detailed when it comes to what specifically to do to address a problem or what is the, what is, where's the rub that is affecting clinical care, um, say, or d d diagnosis um, for people with dementia, and what exact recommendation does this group need to make to, to get to that? So um, know that we recognize that, that you are not expected to be an expert in all of these very many topics or in the very detailed nuances of state Medicaid long-term care policy, um, but that's what the federal employees are here for. We serve as sort of a technical assistance group and can help to make sure that the recommendations are tailored to meeting what the problems are or the goals are of the advisory council members on the public side. So the federal members, you just, all of the non-federal members just had your ethics training. Federal members cannot advocate to the federal government. Um, we cannot advocate to um, Congress, um, but we, what we can do is provide technical assistance on where the, the levers are that you might want to change or what specifically could or could not happen with an existing authority to make the change that our public members want to make as part of their um, recommendations process. So our subcommittee, so most of our work is done in the subcommittee um, settings. Uh, research, which is chaired by Randy Bateman, uh, has historically focused on biomedical research, but over time has expanded to include more and more care and services um, research. Um, recommendations in the past have focused on funding, um, clinical trial enrollment and diversity, brain donations and other research infrastructure. Um, and as I mentioned, it's becoming more and more um, attuned to the needs of the LTSS um, parts of the national plan, the clinical care parts of the national plan. And then of course, much of the risk reduction work, which we just heard about was funded by um, NIH. So research, um, again, historically focused on biomedical, but really is a cross cutting area um, and focus. Um, clinical care, where we um, are currently looking for a chair, um, focuses mostly on healthcare, um, and <laughs> that's quite a bit. Um, so healthcare is primarily delivered in the context of Medicare, but of course we have the VA represented on our advisory council and IHS, um, and it covers everything from you know payment policy through Medicare all the way down to detection and diagnosis. The workforce is a big part of the clinical care subcommittee's purview and the recommendations um, enhancing care quality and what care delivery should look like for these populations, transitions, um, and then the other types of care that people with dementia um, receive. And last year, or the last few years, we've had a big focus on how to incorporate the caregivers into the clinical care setting and what role they should play and what changes the healthcare system um, needs in order to um, incorporate the caregivers effectively. Next slide, please. Uh, our other two um, subcommittees are long-term services and supports, and here we focus on everything from um, the institutional settings like nursing homes, assisted living, um, to home and community-based settings like adult day services, uh, community-based HCBS, or home and community-based services, that's what the HCBS acronym is for, um, as well as the caregivers. And so anything to support caregivers is also part of the work that we do and understanding the needs of caregivers are part of this LTSS um, subcommittee. So again, very vast um, topic area with many, many implications for um, policy, for different types of recommendations, for uh, a different, for workforce, frankly, um, there are many more challenges and nuances to financing long-term services and supports, which we can 
um, get into at some point, but it's a little bit different than uh, Medicare, where most people over age 65 have access to Medicare as a payer for their health care services. That's not the case for um, LTSS. And so um, understanding those nuances is important to, to crafting the recommendations and the work that that subcommittee does. Um, and Helen Bundy Medsger has graciously agreed to chair that subcommittee going forward. So we thank her for that. And then finally, our newest subcommittee is the Risk Reduction Subcommittee, which Joanne Pike chairs. Um, and thanks so much to her and her team for organizing that great panel that we just had. Um, and this focuses on what we just heard, existing and growing research on risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, and where the crux of this work is, is translating what we just heard, where the research is into both public health practice, but also in many cases, clinical practice as well. Um, and so it's an exciting area to be work, working on, but a lot of different systems are affected um, by, or, or need to be affected to treat the risk reduction risk factors um, effectively. Um, and there's also a big focus in that group on thinking about how to create communities and um, settings that support healthy aging. So we're not just focusing on though an individual should do X, Y, and Z, but how do we create places um, and systems that make risk reduction activities and healthy aging activities the default, the easy thing to do so that we are taking away any of the challenges that come from um, differential settings, different access, access to resources, um, history, et cetera, and make it as easy as possible for people to do the things that will um, promote their brain health. Uh, next slide. So in, in the context of these um, four subcommittees, the advisory council makes recommendations. Um, they're made by the non-federal members of the advisory council so that we are, are in accordance with the Hatch Act and the other ethics um, uh, considerations. Um, the recommendations are made to the secretary of HHS in Congress. However, they can also be targeted at states, at local communities, at other professional organizations, et cetera. Um, but those are the two entities that it goes to. Um, they can be precise and targeted recommendations, like you should change this very specific thing, or higher level aspirational goals, um, you know, increase the diversity of the clinical trial participants by X percentage. Um, and often our recommendations are made because they're big, big problems um, year after year. Um, but it's nice to watch, again, the arc of progress in this space and see major recommendations like that NIH sh should convene a um, summit, a research summit focused specifically on dementia care and services um, become a reality and not only a reality, a reality that has been institutionalized and is now part of the regular um, cycle of research um, summits that NIH does, for example. And then the guide model that was released by CMMI uh, this July at our meeting really takes both recommendations that we have had for a number of years about comprehensive dementia care, components of um, recommendations we had before that, support for caregivers, a little bit of respite, um, care coordination, et cetera. And, and over time, you actually start to see um, these recommendations come to life. Um, they might not be exactly the year that the recommendation is um, made, but know that HHS and its federal partners, all of the members of the advisory committee, and then outside entities are looking to this group and its recommendations to guide what work should be done in this space, what do we need to be thinking about, and to sort of set an agenda going forward for improving care for people with dementia um, and their loved ones. So our 2023 recommendations were just posted on the um, NAPA website if you'd like to um, check them out. We'll get into that a little bit more um, at the orientation, but they're a really nice summary of all of the work that the subcommittees did last year, which was quite extensive um, to make recommendations on how to move the ball forward on each of those four um, topic areas. Our national plan is currently in departmental clearance within um, HHS and has been reviewed by our federal agency partners, and we're hoping to get it out um, late November or early December. And there you will see how the recommendations have been implemented in the work that um, we are doing at the federal level. Um, 
I don't know if I should stop for questions here. If anyone has quick questions. Okay, seeing none. Um, it's then my pleasure to turn it over to uh, my federal agency colleagues to talk about the work that your agencies have done again over the last um, 11, 12 years uh, under the purview of Napa and related to Napa and then also some exciting developments in our space um, during the last quarter. Um, I listed the order of federal agency presenters in the chat and so we can just move on as, as slides come up. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. And I'll start to, turn to Dr. Hodes. Thank you, Helen. Um, so I'm pleased to present on behalf of NIH along with Walter Korshetz, uh, the director of NINDS, uh, the two institutes which play a predominant leading role in Alzheimer's and related dementias research. Next slide, please. So this is a cartoon which illustrates the core and some of the areas of research that are supported by NIH, prevention and treatment, care and get caregiver support, which was alluded to, biomarkers, a subject of an ongoing uh, meeting today that's competing with some of our members, a research enterprise as infrastructure, disease mechanisms and population studies. Next, please. So in terms of how input comes to the national plan and to NIH planning efforts, uh, we have um, multiple lines of input from academic research community, from workshops that are held. Uh, they pivot in particular around uh, an annual and rotation uh, summits, summits on Alzheimer's disease research, on Alzheimer's-related dementia research, and on care and services, all in rotation. So every year, one of these three is rotating. And then as a result of all of these, uh, we, con uh, we've, we convene um, the global population of subject matter experts, of advocates, of patients living with and affected by dementia, and identify uh, gaps and opportunities in the research area, uh, which then lead to uh, identification of implementation milestones. So the milestones are what are necessary to achieve the goals of the plan. They are in great detail. They illustrate the means that are necessary to achieve each of the goals. Uh, the funding opportunities that come from them are all, all also initiated at uh, NIH level by NIA and NINDS. But in, in addition, uh, nearly all of the other institutes at NIH are involved in this area and, uh, and support documents that also uh, document the uh, AD and ADRD science advances. Next, please. So the milestones are organized in the categories shown here. Uh, epidemiology and population studies, disease mechanisms, diagnosis, assessment, and disease mon mon monitoring, translational research, dementia care and impact of disease, research resources, and AD-related dementia focus. Next, please. And to give, especially to those uh, who are new to the enterprise, a sense of how the federal investment has grown for Alzheimer's and related dimensions research, starting in 2015, when the substantial, almost unprecedented increase in congressional appropriations for AD and ADRD research began, you can see summarized to the right in the red box for the total for AD and related dimensions, about a, approximately a six-fold increase in funding. Same for Alzheimer's disease research. For the related dementias, about sixfold, Lewy body disease, frontotemporal dementia, and vascular uh, cognitive dementia, all increase at a relatively similar pace, uh, a nearly unprecedented increase invested, in expressing the commitment of Congress, House, Senate, and the uh, administration to expanding the research resources that are committed to these areas of research. Next, please. So here's just a, an identify, identification of one real paradigm shift, which is a, a, a block from the traditional perception of a one-to-one -one relationship between brain pathology and clinical dementia diagnosis. Uh, in fact, that this is the exception, not the rule. When you look here at the pie diagram, you can see that the vast majority of 
pathologies are in the category of mixed pathology. So they are Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, co cognitive impairment, uh, all of which point to now our appreciation of the importance for uh, targeting research towards a combination of research areas and eventually uh, the ability to, in, in real world, target the individualized um, research areas for uh, Alzheimer's related dementias. Uh, each year we renew our budget and appropriations. Each year there is a, a, um, a summary of milestones that are identifying gaps. The gaps in turn are, modify, are, are exemplifying um, areas of important research. And these in turn uh, are uh, the outline for the research enterprise in areas of AD and ADRD uh, research. Next, please. Now, <clears throat> just some examples of the quite extraordinary research accomplishments in the past years. Ten years ago, hard to imagine, but true that we knew of only t 10 genes associated in any way with Alzheimer's. Now we know of and are researching more than 70 related genetic variants, which offer new diverse targets for intervention. Before the early 2000s, Alzheimer's was only diagnosed after death. Now, NIH-funded research has led to the development of imaging and biomarkers to enable more precise and earlier diagnosis. Next, please. And next. Some events ongoing, uh, there's a, a NASA, and that's National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, congressional mandate to carry out a study that will look at the areas of research necess necessary to meet the goals of the national plan, in effect. It will be a, a, a survey of the areas of um, areas of, of research uh, across the dimensions of the milestones that you saw. Uh, there, this will include uh, both the R&D pipeline from basic translational clinical research, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, uh, identifying key barriers to advancing research, uh, the generation of biomarkers, uh, all of this to help to us to identify and explore the most promising areas of research aimed at preventing and treating Alzheimer's and related dementias. You can see the timetable here. The task force was established in March. The committee was established in September. The committee first meeting was in October and the report will be forthcoming in the January to March, 2025 timeframe. Next, please. Two other ongoing activities and summits. Uh, one is the Cognitive Aging Summit. Uh, this is going to be held in March of 2024, uh, co-funded by the Foundation for NIH and the McKnight Brain Research Foundation. Uh, I invite you to pay attention and look for the forthcoming announcement and, and invitation to participate. Similarly, you can see that the 2024 NIH Alzheimer's Disease Research Summit will be held September 23rd and 24th, 2024. Uh, these two are been landmarks of the planning process, and we will be publicizing the announcements and invite participation of all of you to uh, play a role in this identification of gaps, priorities, and resources. Next, please. And let me turn it to uh, my colleague, Walter Korshek, then to talk to NINDS-led programs and updates. Walter. Well, thank you very much, Richard. And uh... Just been fantastic working with the Aging Institute on this uh, problem of neurodegeneration leading to dementia in the elderly. Next slide. Uh, from the NINDS side, um, we focus on what's called the Alzheimer related dementias, and those are classified as frontal temporal dementia, uh, Lewy body dementia, which is the dementia that occurs in Parkinson's. Some people develop the dementia before the Parkinson's, some uh, years into their Parkinson's. And then the vascular contribution to dementia, which we heard a lot about in the prevention uh, risk factor discussion earlier. 
And uh, as Richard mentioned, um, in the elderly, uh, where we see the greatest uh, issue, uh, public health issue with uh, dementia, there's frequently a mix of different pathologies. And so the treatments to be effective are really gonna have to know what a person has and, and that the uh, intervention is targeted at what is causing their problem in the brain. Um, so just to mention a couple of things that we would never have been able to do um, without NAPA and, uh, and the funding are uh, uh, first, our first four in this list are three major programs to get at the vascular contribution to dementia, trying to understand um, how we would identify those in, uh, in uh, people who are at risk. And the hope is certainly with Mark VCID that we would develop biomarkers that we could target for interventions that would improve cerebral vascular health and reduce uh, one's uh, dementia risk. Um, we have programs like Detect CID, which is I think even more important now to have uh, mechanisms that uh, folks coming into clinic to see their primary care physicians can be assessed for early signs of dementia, particularly in going to be important in understanding their uh, eligibility for the new treatments that come across. Uh, we also have programs in frontal temporal dementia to understand the molecular mechanisms that lead to the different types of frontal temporal dementia um, and, uh, and uh, 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 a interesting program uh, in REM sleep disorder thinking, well, what does that have to do? Well, it turns out that many of the people who develop uh, Lewy body dementia start out uh, decades earlier with a sleep disorder and one can find evidence for the pathologic protein aggregation called synuclein in those folks. So it's an opportunity to study people uh, years before they develop any cognitive impairment. Um, and uh, the last ones to mention are the Connect TBI program, trying to understand the link between traumatic brain injury and cognitive impairment and dementia. Uh, so it's a previous history, still somewhat controversial, but definitely worth studying um, to see what that tie-in is, because that's something that's also preventable. And then um, uh, Richard, uh, uh, the Aging Institute and the NINDS uh, are uh, pioneering and launching a center for Alzheimer's disease research in the intramural program at uh, Bethesda campus. That's very exciting and take advantage of a lot of the resources there um, that are just not available in the, in the universities around the country. Next slide. Uh, next slide uh, also mentions the fact that we uh, recently had a workshop about what's turning out to be an important problem, and that is uh, uh, swelling in the brain and damage to blood vessels with bleeding into the brain as a consequence of being treated with the anti-beta amyloid immunotherapies that have now been approved by the uh, FDA. Very similar to a condition that's been under study for many years called cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, and uh, so we're funding uh, and uh, have calls out for more grants to try and understand how to protect the blood brain barrier um, in these folks being treated uh, with anti-amyloid therapies. Next slide. And I uh, just wanted to mention a couple of things that uh, come out through the uh, research uh, at the Aging Institute and others. Um, and this is two examples of um, uh, studies in individual patients who have risk factors for developing Alzheimer's disease, but don't develop it when you think they should uh, and don't develop it till many years later. And what's been found in these, both of these mutations is that people uh, develop amyloid in the brain as one would expect given their risk factors, but they don't develop dementia and they don't develop the tau protein aggregation, which is seemingly the, the, the downstream effect of amyloid uh, aggregation of the brain that then leads to the cell death. So both these, both these uh, mutations uh, are really powerful in their protective effects. And so, a lot of interest in trying to turn them into uh, therapies. Next slide. And uh, just to mention, as, as was spoken about today in the earliest session, uh, high blood pressure is 
you know, it's right out there for us to make a difference in. 50% um, of people with high blood pressure do not have a control. Uh, people don't know their numbers. They don't realize how important high blood pressure control is. And actually the greatest risk group is actually middle-aged African-American males. And so we actually have a program that been going on for a number of years, but has renewed its focus on this on this group to, to really educate them about the need to get um, blood pressure under control, not just for heart, for heart disease, but also for their risk of cog cognitive impairment and dementia as they age. Next slide. And uh, so that's that. Those are the kind of points I wanted to put across. And, and once again, working with the Aging Institute, I think we we really kind of moved the ball forward uh, in in many of these uh, conditions that cause dementia. Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard and Walter. Um, that was a very good, very quick summary of all of the amazing scientific discoveries we've had over the last. Um, 12 years, and there's much, much more for anyone who wants to look in detail. Um, so Teresa Baraccio, who is our representative for the FDA, couldn't be here today, um, and so I'm going to uh, present her slide. Um, there is a more detailed presentation from FDA from our April meeting, so if you're interested, the videos are available on our website. But real quick, um, the FDA is responsible for protecting the health of the American public by ensuring the safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs, biological products, and medical devices, and also um, tracking and ensuring the safety of, of food, cosmetics, and products that emit radiation. Um, and FDA is probably most well known in this space for their approval, full approval of monoclonal antibodies that target amyloid in Alzheimer's disease um, for lecanemab in 2023. That was sort of the traditional full approval route um, and the accelerated approval of aducanemab in 2021. Uh, FDA has also approved or cleared a number of products for diagnosing um, Alzheimer's disease, including cerebral spinal fluid-based diagnostics um, in the last two years, tau PET imaging agents, and then amyloid PET imaging agents. Um, and so uh, there's much more, of course, that FDA does. Um, their purview is pretty limited and set uh, in many regards um, in statute, but these are the um, major updates from the FDA in the last uh, couple of years. Next, I will turn it to Sherry Ling to go over CMS's um, full view and then quick updates. Terrific. Thank you um, so much, Helen. And if we could have the next slide, and um, I'm, I'm actually going to just uh, address uh, for, especially for our new members, provide you with a little bit of background information about uh, CMS. Uh, some of the authorities that CMS is committed to applying um, in the development and implementation of, of programs and policies that serve um, our beneficiaries that right now, um, we, the policies had been reaching one in three Americans and it's, it's now looking like close to one in two. Americans in some way across Medicare, Medicaid, and, and the marketplace. Um, importantly, we've been observing the increasing complexity of the populations of people who we serve. So um, by way of background, uh, those with uh, living with dementia in Medicare, about less than 5% of the population has just dementia alone. And the rest of the population has has numerous uh, other comorbidities, uh, estimating that um, over over half have more than five or more other conditions. So we keep that in mind in program development and implementation. Again, focusing on the people who we serve, who are living with uh, dementia and also other conditions. Um, our major role has been uh, that of a payer and uh, paying globally, the largest payer across, uh, across the globe, but really focusing more and more on paying for value of healthcare rather than volume of healthcare services. Um, and 
so with that in mind, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity um, working together to focus on what are the outcomes that are meaningful and, and to drive towards uh, in through care and service delivery and also to include those outcomes in uh, evidence development, the evidence that CMS and our other intervention um, programs uh, that our federal partners are charged with uh, really need for better policy and program development. Um, so over time, um, CMS has implemented the annual wellness visit, which was uh, which which came to light in the context um, of the Affordable Care Act and included cognitive assessment, but not requiring the use of specific instruments um, and, and recognizing the importance in some cases of using instruments uh, for detection purposes as opposed to di diagnostic purposes, just making a subtle distinction. Also developed additional payment codes that support um, time and uh, opportunities to assess cognition, beginning as a G code, then transitioning into a CPT code. And there are more that will be mentioned um, it, it shortly. Um, in addition to payment though, another uh, authority that CMS has utilized is that of coverage. Um, although 90% of coverage decisions are, are made at the, the, the local level, you know, the, the smaller percentage, but nationally applicable coverage decisions um, over recent years had included the, the PET for beta amyloid um, coverage decision, which initially was under coverage with evidence development, which is CMS will cover the procedure as evidence is generated, as research is conducted, providing um, beneficiaries and people who receive Medicare benefits are enrolled in, in clinical trials. And, and we recently transitioned that and, and sunset the coverage decision. So now it is under local contractor discretion, removing the original cap of one study per lifetime. Um, and of course, you all have been uh, very uh, attentive to the coverage decisions pertaining to monoclonal antibodies to treat uh, Alzheimer's disease um, and uh, recognizing though the distinction between CMS authorities, which really um, focus on clinical utility of diagnostic tests and also therapeutic interventions, which is different, but complementary to that um, of, of FDA. Um, so over time though, we also address care and services and uh, quality of, of care and health care safety during the context or through the context of our work um, in with facilities, um, the minimum health and safety standards that then are um, that are then uh, enforced by uh, our quality safety oversight group that has been charged with and has implemented the behavioral health program um, to in, it, to enable better uh, health care, not just physical health care but also mental health care uh, for people who receive care and services in long-term care facilities. Um, and uh, just to round it out, uh, many of you have contributed to um, the, the work of the Innovation Center's initial um, healthcare innovation awards that actually then subsequently informed the development um, of the guide model which really is, is meant to support care and services um, while also tracking uh, quality and, and cost as is true to the CMMI authority. Um, and so that's the background 
uh, over time. Um, and I actually would like to turn this the, the mic over uh, to my colleague, Ellen Blackwell. Ellen is a geriatric social worker. And so, you know, we believe in it, interdisciplinary team-based care. And so we're, we're gonna, uh, we share this, this honor. So Ellen, over to you. So nice to see everybody here. Welcome to the new members. So glad to have you with us. Um, I'm just gonna tag team a little bit of, um, of what Sherry mentioned. Helen asked us to do a little bit of quick thinking about what's happened over the past 10 years and you know some important things that CMS has done to support um, people with dementia. And, and there actually are quite a few things. Um, um, back in the beginning of the Innovation Center, we started with the Healthcare Innovation Awards and this was a flexible little program that permitted states and providers to um, do some experimentation sort of more at the ground level. And there were, as most of you know, uh, I want to say about five or six of these projects that focused specifically on dementia that, you know, kind of grew and built in some ways into our new guide dementia model. Um, so that was very helpful in terms of helping us shape what we're going to be doing now. Um, the accountable health communities model uh, looked at, you know, helping people stay in the community. So I would sort of flag that one as one that looked at people with dementia. And, and there are many other accountable care models at the Innovation Center that, you know, may not specifically mention dementia, but certainly have beneficiaries with dementia enrolled in them and um, many, many different entities providing a variety of care. So from there, I started thinking about our duals office and um, we, the duals office runs something called the Integrated Care Resource Center. And they've been doing this for about six years and there are regular presentations similar to what ACL does you know, on people with dementia that have more of a um, Medicare, Medicaid twist. Um, some of them, again, aren't specific to dementia, but I do think they have um, applicability to this population. There's our new um, Nursing Home Center of Excellence that just kicked off fairly recently, and I'll show you a slide about it later, but um, they are also doing some interesting things um, in terms of supporting behavioral health in nursing facilities. And the Civil Mon Monetary Penalties Program, the CMP program, much easier to say. If you take a look at our website, you know, I'm always kind of surprised at the number of projects. These, these are funds that states are able to reinvest in, you know, projects of their choice. And I want to say maybe upwards of 60% of them are targeted to people with dementia. So there's a lot happening there and a lot of innovation, again, at the, as low as the um, nursing home level. Um, our hand-in-hand -hand program that did a really good job explaining um, how direct support workers and CNAs in, working in nursing homes can have more success with people with dementia. I think Sherry mentioned a couple new payment codes, our cognitive assessment and care planning service, and then I also think the chronic care management services, um, especially maybe for somebody who um, has cognitive issues, maybe not Alzheimer's disease. Um, many people with dementia, as all of you know, have multiple chronic conditions, but those codes can support people with dementia. We have a new code that pays for chronic pain management. And oftentimes someone with cognitive um, issues can't talk about pain. So I think that code could um, also have applicability. Um, we've made updates to our annual wellness visit guidance, our welcome to Medicare visit guidance, um, our advanced care planning guidance. We've made it clear that that covers psychiatric advanced directives where um, the person is able to say what they want to happen to them in the event that they cannot articulate it. Um, during the pandemic and even 
after we've made a lot of flexibilities on the Medicaid side to home and community-based services. Um, many states are running programs for older adults that um, help this population and including, you know, laying out a basic set of quality improvements. Um, Sherry mentioned the many things happening with um, drug coverage and test coverage. And um, if you take a look at our, um, at our physician fee schedule proposal for this year, there are a number of proposals that I think could um, benefit people with dementia that have not been finalized yet principal illness navigation and uh, caregiver training. So hopefully we'll um, hear more about this in the future. And that is all I have. That was quite a bit to come up with at the top of my head, but it sort of shows you all the things that are happening at CMS and that have happened over the past 10 years. Thank you so much, Ellen and Sherry. Um, do we have anyone on from the VA? I saw Scotty before, but I don't know if we've lost, lost him. Okay, well then in the interest of time, let's go beyond VA. We will have them featured at a future uh, meeting because I could not possibly speak to how they are organized and how much they do also in the research, clinical care and LTSS space. Um, so we are gonna turn it over to um, IHS and either Bruce Fink or Jolie Crowder will um, take us away from there. Bruce? Hey, Julie. Sorry, I was double muted. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I knew I saw you. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to be fairly brief. I'll start off uh, with just a quick overview of Indian Health for those who may not be as familiar. We're the agency within uh, the federal government responsible for federal health services for American Indians, Alaska Natives within HHS. Um, and uh, through IHS Direct, Tribal, and Urban Indian uh, Health Organization, Urban Indian Organizations, we provide a comprehensive healthcare delivery system for approximately two and a half million uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives who belong to 574 federally recognized tribes in 37 states. And this care, this, this relationship, and this work is based in the government to government relationship between the federal government and um, federally recognized tribes. The system of care that we describe in, involves um, Indian Health Service, direct federal services through hospitals, health centers, health stations, tribally owned and operated uh, health services in which tribes receive the funding allocated by Congress for the care of their citizens, but they own and operate this, the, the, the care themselves in uh, hot, uh, 22 hospitals, 279 health centers, 79 health stations. And um, Urban Indian Health Care Services operated by urban Indian organizations that are based in the community um, in 41 different urban centers, um, providing a variety of services, everything from targeted um, behavioral health services to full range primary care services. Um, in 59 different locations. So that's an overview of Indian Health. I'll just say it also includes kind of a public, a public health infrastructure, including facilities management, um, sanitation and engineering, and on home, uh, uh, water um, services. So it's a fairly broad, it's an, a, new, a unique system in the U.S. Um, and the Indian Health Service, we are both um, providers but also purchasers of, of health care and health services for the population. Um, uh, we'll go on to the next slide. And I'm, I, for the first decade or so of um, NAPA, we benefited incredibly from the rich conversation and, uh, and sharing of information at NAPA. It put a tailwind to our work. We did not have specific funding to address um, Alzheimer's. We were able to do quite a bit of work around care, in, in uh, caregiver support, as well as workforce development through partnerships and collaboration with other federal agencies and non-federal uh, organizations. Um, 
we have the, the game changed for us in 2021 uh, when we received our first funding, congressionally appropriated funding, um, for to address Alzheimer's. And and that funding really is a result of the work of NAPA um, and the advocacy of the non-federal members of NAPA. And um, so we're we're very grateful and and see see the work we can do now as an outgrowth of the NAPA process and the advisory council's work. Um, we have really four sets of priorities for that work. Um, and the largest priority, and, and these priorities were, um, were, were informed by what we knew to be congressional intent, but really shaped by an extensive tribal consultation urban confer in which we, we spoke, we went to all of the areas in IHS and um, that all the, uh, through a formal process to get input into how we set our priorities, how we use these funds. Um, uh, and these four air priority areas, the largest, well, well over half of the funding goes to grants and program awards for Indian health programs for the development of, of uh, both comprehensive models of care and specific care and services. Now, the, the notion of comprehensive models of care is rooted in the notion that, um, that tribes need to be able to, and urban Indian organizations need to be able to take evidence-based models of care and adapt them uh, to their communities and that we'll learn through that adaptation uh, what works best in tribal communities and we'll ac accelerate adoption by sharing amongst the tribal communities and that's the mo that's the approach we're taking to the development of models of care we started off with four grantees in 2022 and in 2023 we have an additional eight funded so we now have 12 tribes tribal organizations and urban Indian health or urban Indian organizations funded to develop this, these services. We'll also have some funding going out for targeted services, focusing on priority areas that we um, are aware of in, in things like caregiver support and workforce development. And um, we're, we're, we're still in the process of, of developing that, those, um, that funding, those funding opportunities. Um, the second largest, uh, priority area for us is in workforce development, education, and training. Um, we, we know from conversations with, um, with uh, folks in, on the ground and in the communities that whether they're receiving care from an urban Indian organization, a tribal health program, or an ITS program, that, um, that folks have trouble getting to a timely diagnosis they have trouble getting to, uh, uh, to to a full assessment of of the needs of their needs and to and to services, um, and that we have some work to do in building capacity within our uh, our workforce so that folks can get the care that they need. We're focusing currently on a, a set of projects that will be expanding. Um, the first set is. Uh, the Indian Health Geriatric Scholars. This is a, a model of workforce development that we've adopted um, and adapted with the support of the VA from the VA that works at building expertise and skills in the primary care workforce. We're, we, uh, we're in our second year of this program. It's been really gratifying to see the work that's going on there. Um, and we'll continue to grow that group of primary care champions for uh, geriatric care and for care for those living with Alzheimer's. We've developed an, an, a, a set, two ECHO uh, programs, uh, one in clinical care and the other in caregiver support in partnership with the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, and that's, um, that those are uh, each monthly. Um, we've engaged in a, an early detection, uh, dementia detection initiative with the Division of Oral Health with support, um, a lot of in-kind support uh, from the CDC-funded Bold Center on Early Detection, and we're grateful for that. Um, and in that program in particular, um, our, our dentists are learning how to, how to put um, the tools for early detection into their toolkit so that they can under, better meet the needs of the older patients and those with cognitive impairment in their practices. We're also working with community health representatives program who are community health workers, and they they've been um, 
especially interested both in caregiver support and in some of the prevention work, particularly around hypertension um, and, and risk mitigation. Um, and when we've worked with Division of Nursing around geriatric ED accreditation. <clears throat> the, last two, the, the last two areas of focus are on, on outreach and awareness, and we're shaping that even as we speak. And then building the data and program support resources to support tribes and urban Indian organizations um, to, in, in this work. So uh, I'll, I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. We'll go into a lot of detail in coming quarters, I hope, as we update you on the work in, in these particular areas. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Joan? Thanks, Helen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joan Weiss. I'm the Deputy Director in the Division of Medicine and Dentistry at the Health Resources and Services Administration. And our mission is to improve health outcomes and achieve health equity through access to quality services, a skilled health workforce, and innovative high-value programs. And uh, since 2011, uh, these are our accomplishments. We provided um, uh, primarily through our HRSA Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program over uh, 6,000 interprofessional educational offerings on dementia to over 700,000 trainees. And um, the purpose of our geriatrics workforce enhancement program is to develop a healthcare workforce that maximizes patient family engagement to improve health outcomes for older adults by integrating geriatrics and primary care. And uh, for us, the workforce uh, consists of, at the center of our model, patients, families, and caregivers, as well as the direct care workforce, uh, health, prof uh, health professions, students, residents, fellows, and faculty, and health care providers. Um, uh, since 2011, we also published two Medscape articles uh, one was on case challenges uh, in early Alzheimer's disease, and the other was the bidirectional impact of Alzheimer's disease and common comorbid conditions. Well, we also developed our Alzheimer's disease and related uh, dementia curriculum, which is uh, posted on our website. Uh, it can, it consists of 16 uh, modules on dementia and nine modules on um, care, uh, caregiving, uh, which the purpose was really to help caregivers uh, caring for persons living with dementia, but it turns out to be really um, relatable to all caregivers. Uh, we have uh, seen an increase uh, in the use of multimedia and um, different modes of uh, delivering education and training. And we received funding in 2021 20, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, provide COVID-19 training. Uh, and as a result of that, we are in the process of, of finalizing our COVID-19 nursing home training uh, that specifically includes dementia, and there are several modules on uh, dementia. Uh, also, we had a competition in 2023 uh, for our Geriatrics Academic Career Awards program. And uh, while this is uh, a program that promotes the career development of academic uh, geriatric specialists, we also uh, required that they educate and train the healthcare workforce within the context of age-friendly health systems framework to address dementia risk reduction, dementia across the disease trajectory, including training with dementia medications they are approved by uh, use, as they, they're approved for use, as well as health disparities, uh, social determinants of health and, and nursing home care. So um, the, a, a, a big portion of that award is to provide training to uh, 
interprofessional teams of healthcare professionals. We plan on having a competition in 2024 for our geriatrics workforce enhancement program. And that, um, that uh, funding opportunity is in clearance. We will let you know when it uh, becomes available. Thank Thanks, you so much, um, Next, we have uh, ACL and Aaron Long. Hello. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick um, little bit of background on the Administration for Community Living. We're kind of a newer um, uh, operating division within the Department of Health and Human Services. The Administration for Community Living was actually established in 2012, and it's when HHS, we were able to merge aging and disability programs. We emerged the Administration on Aging, the the Office on Disability, and the Administration on Developmental Disabilities. Um, what this exercise did was it brought together federal advocacy for older adults and peoples with, people with disabilities. The States Act had actually been doing it, um, and we followed them. Uh, most uh, federal human service programs, <coughs> uh, so we, it brought together most of the federal human service programs for older adults and people with disabilities. And our founding pr principle is people with disabilities and older adults should be able to live where they choose with the people they choose and fully participate in their communities. And for the purposes of this discussion, the um, Alzheimer's and dementia work resides within the administration on aging within the administration for community living. Next slide, please. So at the um, Administration for Community Living, we have been funding Alzheimer's and dementia programs for many years. Um, in 2014, we started, we expanded our programs to be able to um, begin funding. We'd always been funding through the states, and then we just, we were able to get resources through the Affordable Care Act to begin getting resources to the to the community level so that they could identify the needs of their communities and, and um, work to address their needs that way. This uh, graphic just sort of gives a really high level snapshot at the different types of organizations that um, we are funding to address the needs of the community. It's also, um, that's on the left side, the AAAs and the universities and, and just a broad, broad range of um, home and community-based service providers, long-term service and support providers that are um, benefiting through our programs. But Im importantly, the underserved and diverse populations that our grantees are addressing um, is ever-expanding. And we're super proud of that. Um, one of the really cool things that we do through our programming is um, anything that's created through these grants is available to everyone. We, uh, you'll see on our next, my next slide, I'm going to talk about the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center, but our grantees are piloting programs to determine um, whether or not they're going to work in their communities. They all come with um, significant evaluation efforts, robust evaluation efforts. And one thing that's unique to this program is through these pilot programs, we're not, it's not sustaining anything. It's all new work. Um, we require that 50% of their funding go to direct service. And you'll see in the red box in the corner that since 2014, we've, um, our grantees have delivered two point, almost 2.6 million hours of direct service um, in these pilot programs. I, th I think it's really super important to, to emphasize that these are pilot programs and that we evaluate the work to determine, to give people the um, evidence to go to funders beyond the federal system to sustain programs. Um, so we're really proud of the $2.6 million, $2.6 million hours of direct service. Next slide, please. Just want to give you a quick snapshot of one of um, our key resource centers, the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center. We have a contract that not only provides technical assistance to all of our grantees, but also it's home to all of those resources, tools, webinars, everything that's created through these programs that's determined to be um, of utility. Um, we post it on, we get 508 compliant um, 
uh, 508, which means accessible uh, for non-feds. It's, uh, we have 508 compliant versions of, of tools and presentations and education programs, and we post them there. And um, so that people are constantly recreating the wheels and they're able to co-brand with the creators and just create um, new tools. There's a ton of um, translated materials there. We have it, things in Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Russian, er, we're, and, and we're soon to have um, Arabic and, and other, and other um, languages. Uh, next slide, please. Part of our program also, everybody is required, well, we've heard a lot today about evidence-based interventions. Part of our grant program is requiring everybody to do an evidence-based or an evidence-informed intervention. Um, this is just sort of a snapshot of the evidence-based and evidence-informed interventions. The importance of focusing, having a little bit of focus on that evidence-informed piece is Oftentimes our grantees are bringing cultural competence to the evidence-based interventions that they're implementing. So, you know, taking them one step down to, to bring uh, the cultural competency to them um, really is a very important step. Um, here you'll also see the outcomes the, for caregivers and outcome for people with living, living with dementia that are reported through these grants. We have a compendium of the interventions, but and we also have a compendium of the outcomes and the tools that um, are out in the public domain that um, the links are at the bottom of, of this slide. So if you wanted to go check out the different sorts of, um, of interventions and the related outcomes, uh, they're there for your, your perusal. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick update since our last meeting, we have since this early this summer, we have awarded 18 new grants through our um, Alzheimer's Disease Program Initiative State and Community Grant Program. That was four new states and um, 12 community-based organizations. We also, um, our National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center also um, does amazing um issue brief papers, I'm not sure what we had, what category they would all necessarily fall into, but, and not only do they address um, very important issues in the field of dementia, but they also tie them back to the work that our grantees are doing and, and give um, uh, lessons learned and such um, on, on the issues that we're addressing through our state and community grant program. Through our community grant program, we do a lot of work. Everybody's required to work in um, uh, working with people who live alone with dementia and as well as um, people living with intellectual and developmental disabilities and dementia. So that's a big piece of the work we're doing. So this year they did the promising programs and services for people living alone. And then also, of course, we're all very concerned with uh, social isolation and lo loneliness generally for older adults, but um, it's an even a bigger uh, challenge when it comes to um, people living with dementia and their caregivers. So we have the paper on that as well and how um, the broader community and the ACL grant community has been addressing these issues. And I think that might be my last slide. Oh, no, we do. We have a, we have a webinar on Thursday. We're very excited. We are going to, um, Greg Link, the director of ACL's Office of Supportive and Caregiver Services, and also the uh, lead on the RAISE Act and the National Strategy strategy to Support Caregivers uh, National Strategy National Strategy is going to do a webinar for us uh, and tying uh, ways, ways in which you could tie the activities for the National Strategy uh, with the thread through dementia on them. And so we're super excited that that's uh, Thursday afternoon, and you can uh, register. There's a link on the link at the bottom if you were interested. As of uh, last week, we had a thousand people registered, so we're super excited. We know it's an issue that's important to a lot of people. And now I do think that's my last slide. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, Arlene Bierman? Yeah, okay, next slide. So just to tell you um, 
give you a high level overview of what ARC is. Is our goal, our mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more ac accessible, equitable, and affordable, and to work with HHS and other partners to make sure the evidence is understood and used. So we have a big focus on the uptake of evidence and practice, and it's exciting listening to everything today because there is so much advancement in um, dementia care. Next slide. So what does ARC do? How do we do this? We basically fund health services research um, to understand how care is delivered and how it can be delivered better. Um, we work on moving evidence into practice, including, um, you know, evidence synthesis, which we've done in the past for NIA for some of their NASM um, reports. And we also have data sources that can be used, uh, our MEPS and HCUP for studying um, a whole a range of uh, diseases. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing to improve person-centered care planning for older adults and improve health outcomes in older adults so that as we take up the evidence, we could do it in the context. We also fund a lot of, you know, investigator-initiated work and implementation work that addresses dementia, but I'll have time other another time to talk about those. Next slide. So in the in April we held a roundtable. Uh, actually, Dr. Bims was there, which was very exciting to talk about how can we really transform care to make sure that older adults um, get better care delivery and better outcomes. And we, and we heard today so much about the opportunities for prevention, slowing the de uh, decline, and optimizing function. Next slide. So we identify the report is available online. I'm going to go through my slides very quickly because, you know, I know we're limited on time, but you'll have the slides and they inc include links to get more information. Um, but really the opportunity to develop a truly uh, person-centered care system, including, you know, those partnerships with community organizations, as well as, you know, in addition to age-friendly health systems, but age-friendly public health. And we heard a lot about public health this morning. We really need not only the evidence about what works, you know, to manage, diagnose, treat, and prevent dementia and, and related disorders, but what works to transform care. And also, we need to figure out how to broaden the impact. How do we, when we have effective interventions, how do we scale and spread them across the health system? Next slide. So, there, you know, many of you might be familiar with this, but there's age-friendly movement in multiple domains, age-friendly cities, age-friendly health systems, university, its employers, cities, public health, and bringing them all together into an age-friendly um, ecosystem will certainly help people at risk for or living with dementia. Next slide. And this is a heavy lift because the way we pay for care and our policies don't often support the best practices for dementia. And it's also, you know, changing the culture of practice. You know, we heard um, a lot today about, you know, the role of primary care. And we also need the evidence not only about what works um, to treat the disease, but how do we, what's the evidence around models of care and how to implement those models and scale them. Next slide. So uh, Sherry Ling mentioned this, and this is a nice visual on the number of comorbidities people with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias have. And you can see, you know, she mentioned over half have five additional other conditions. And you can see, you know, 80% have, you know, three or more additional conditions. So we really, to improve their care, we need a person-centered approach. Um, next slide. So ARC has been working for a long time on the developing and expanding our agenda and our work on people living with multiple chronic conditions, which is just about everybody who has um, dementia. And we have a vision for a sustainable healthcare system that delivers high value, coordinated, integrated patient-centered care based in primary care. There's primary care again that has a key role to optimize individual and population health by both preventing and effectively managing multiple chronic conditions. And it's so exciting to see, you know, the work of the uh, risk, you know, reduction group. Next slide. So what is person-centered care? Person-centered care means that individuals' values and preferences are elicited and once expressed, guide all aspects of their care. 
supporting realistic health and life goals, and person-centered care is achieved through a dynamic relationship among individuals, others who are important to them, and all relevant providers. And this collaboration informs decision-making to the extent um, that the individual desires. So just think about, you know, really what, what people living with dementia need. Next slide. And also, you know, the, the National Academy reports, if you haven't looked at this one yet, there's one on whole health, which is focusing on really, you know, what the person wants and, 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 and optimizing health in multiple domains. Next slide. So ARC had published several years back um, a research agenda on multiple chronic conditions, but that we need interventions at multiple, um, at points of the health systems, as well as multi-level um, interventions that bring them together. I mentioned already we need culture change in the way we, we deliver care. We need to address social determinants of health. So much of this has come up today. Um, we need, you know, patients, families, caregivers, and also frontline clinicians to be co-producers of the evidence and co-design our solutions. We need payment reform because sometimes payment now is a barrier to in innovation. And there's, you know, a lot um, of advancements in implementation science and real world research that can really help us. Next slide. So, you know, again, I'm not going to spend time on this slide, but, you know, really exciting to hear about interventions across the continuum of risk from those who have advanced to the disease to those who have modifiable risk factors. Next slide. And so our, you know, in terms of our MCC work, what, what came out was the one thing, if we wanted one lever that would make the biggest difference, was to really implement person-centered care planning and practice. We had a, a request for innovate, um, information um, in the Federal Register. We got a robust response from multiple perspectives. And what we learned from this is that there's a lot of innovation happening in many places. And if we could bring this all together, we could really accelerate um, change. And we're actually about to, we've done a qualitative analysis of the responses. We got several hundred pages and um, we're going to be, you know, submitting that for publication in the near future. Next slide. And as a result of this, we're also going to create um, a learning community and stakeholder engagement for how do we accelerate the uptake of care planning and make it more routine in practice. And I will be um, reaching out to, um, you know, want to hear from you about who is doing this work, who's innovating, who should we hear from, um, you know, from the dementia community to, to inform some of this work. And then the last thing I'm just going to mention is that we're um, developing in partnership with NIDDK an interoperable of electronic care plan for people with multiple chronic conditions. Um, next slide. And, you know, we have this is for time, I won't go through this, but here is a definition of a comprehensive shared care plan. And to have, we know that people, see, you know, with multiple conditions, dementia, see multiple providers and multiple um, places and aggregating their data automatically across multiple um, sites and settings of care. And also we have a patient and caregiver uh, facing component to our app to encourage their participation and make it easier for them. So this, you know, this um, functionality can improve both research and care delivery. Um, next slide, which I think is my last slide. So just what I wanted to mention on here is that we've, we had a technical expert panel We've developed standardized data elements. We've identified them um, for um, care planning. And we've been um, sponsored by HL7 International, who vets international standards for um, electronic health records. And we've already been through the uh, ballot. Um, and, and these should be published in January. So we have standards um, for care planning that could be um, useful. And we're in, in the process of pilot testing the app. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you so much, Arlene. Um, next up, we have Eric Weekly with SAMHSA. Great. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lamont. This is, uh, we really appreciate being a part of it as part of SAMHSA. So just super brief. So I have one slide. Um, so SAMHSA is the agency within uh, HHS that basically implements national 
uh, mental health and substance use treatment programs. Um, so we were developed in, we were established in 1992 and uh, we, um, we were we were kind of outward facing. So we we fund uh, providers, we fund organizations uh, at the community level, we fund states uh, to implement programs, and that's how we differentiate from uh, the National Institute of Mental Health. The NIMH is more research oriented, and we are more the implementers of of uh, best practice and research. The one program you may know that we about that uh, SAMHSA administers is uh, the 988 suicide prevention line. Um, and that's something that we've rolled out the last year or so. And uh, hopefully you've, you've heard about that. Um, so we have a number of, of products that we provide to treatment providers. Uh, that's guidance, uh, briefings, uh, webinars, trainings about best practice with um, with treatment for substance use and, and mental health uh, uh, needs. And we, in many of our products, we do talk about uh, serving older adults, um, people who ha may have Alzheimer's disease or other cognitive impairment. And, um, you know, not that as, as clinicians, um, we need to be aware of treatment protocols and uh, people who develop uh, who have Alzheimer's disease, uh, may have lifelong substance use treatment needs or in, re in recovery uh, or mental health treatment needs that don't end when somebody, when the diagnosis of Alzheimer's is, is made and people may develop um, needs that can be, that are treatable, uh, mental health and substance use treatment needs. We do have, and the final point is we do have a um, t uh, technical assistance center called the E4 Center at Rush Medical uh, University. Um, it is mainly for clinicians, but there is a lot of information there. If you'd like to, I have the link on, on the slides if you'd like to go there. And this year they will be looking at uh, particular, uh, the intersection of Alzheimer's disease, dementia, other cognitive impairment, and substance use and, and mental health treatment. So, and so, and I'll give you updates as the as the year uh, as, as it goes along. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, we have three more agencies to get through, so I'm going to ask for patience from our public commenters who I see have jo um, joined the room. You will have plenty of time for your public comments, but we might go a little bit after the four o'clock hour just to wrap up our agency updates. So, once again, thank you for your patience. Um, Lisa McGuire with CDC. Great. Thank you so much, Helen. Next slide, please. So I'm from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and we were asked to talk a little bit about our agency. So CDC's vision is to equitably protect the health, safety, and security of the United States. So really what CDC is trying to do is detect and respond to new and emerging health threats to really identify and tackle health problems that are the leading causes of death and disability and doing that in ways that's putting science and technology in action to prevent those diseases, and really to try to promote healthy, safe behaviors, communities, and environments. And really the key is we are also taking through our surveillance efforts, we are really taking the pulse of the nation and being able to track some of those types of leading causes of death and disability to try to improve them as much as possible. So how does the public health do that? Next slide. One of the ways that public health operates is really by bridging the gap. So um, the last presenter talked about how they were a little bit different from some of the other federal agencies. Public health operates a little bit differently than the other federal agencies do too. So we are known as a convener and a connector. So we're really helping to take that biomedical research or any sorts of science, it could be implementation science, and really helping to translate, package, see how it works or scale it up so it can get out into the community community and out to through community services. The next slide is just showing where um, the Alzheimer's program sits within CDC. The main thing to point out is we're very um, topic, sometimes disease specific, but the Alzheimer's disease work at CDC does reside within our National Center of Chronic Disease 
prevention and health promotion, which really does fit very nicely with a lot of the work that we do around goal six, um, looking at healthy aging and risk reduction. Next slide, please. So what's happened since the inception of NAPA? Um, very much like Dr. Fink pointed out, a lot has happened at CDC since NAPA. Um, we've seen a large increase in our funding, just as some of our other federal other federal um, organizations have seen too. We have very proudly launched three state and local public health roadmaps for that series. We were able to launch our first ever roadmap for Indian country. Um, we right now are just kicking off the revision process for the next roadmap for Indian country. And so we will re be releasing that in November of 24. Since NAPA, we saw the passage of the BOLD Act which what that meant for CDC is we were able to award our first ever Bold Public Health Centers of Excellence. We awarded three centers for five-year awards. We were able to award our first cycle of Bold programs where we awarded uh, 23 jurisdictions of health, public health for three-year awards. And we just kicked off last week our second cycle, our second cohort of BOLD program awardees. We have 43 awardees, and they were awarded for a five-year cycle. And I'll share with you who they are in just a few minutes. Um, we were able to um, expand our Healthy Brain Initiative Awards from one award to five awards. Um, we were able to launch our Healthy Brain Resource Center, which is a free online portal where people can get various tools, materials, resources that they'd want to use. We launched using our BRFS data, state and national infographics. We also launched a searchable Alzheimer's disease data portal. Um, we were able to help lead with many of our federal colleagues on the phone today, the expansion of the DIA dementia, including Alzheimer's healthy people objectives from two to three. That doesn't sound like a big increase, but healthy people in general was reduced to about a third of its original size. So we were excited to get one new objective added. We've included questions since the launch of NAPA on BRFS and and Haynes, as well as some of the Porter Novelli style surveys. And we also have launched a healthy brain research network and a separate risk reduction thematic network through CDC's prevention research centers. So next slide, please. So for a while, I've been telling you about our next cohort of gold programs. Next slide, please. Here they are. So we are very proud um, and we welcomed to Atlanta last week, the 43 bold programs. You can see here, there's a mix of states, counties. Um, we have some cities and a tribal organization included in here as well. So you'll be hearing more in the next few years about the exciting work that these awardees will be doing within their jurisdiction. And the main activity that they'll be doing is looking at using data within their jurisdiction to really help, to really understand what the need is and then select roadmap actions from our roadmap series. Next slide. Wanna share with you some really cool resources that our Bold Public Health Center of Excellence on risk reduction developed. So the first, you can see the little thumbnail there, but they have developed state specific fact sheets on the prevalence of six risk reduction behaviors or risk reduction factors. These are available for every state. They're free, they're on their website. So I encourage you please to look at them, use them and share them with your friends. The next thing is also really, really cool. They have developed state heat maps um, and also county heat maps down to the census, census track level for six, those six risk factors. So what we're looking at here, and it's really hard, it's small, I understand. Um, this is physical activity um, for the state of Georgia, but you can look at these in much smaller level, meaning jurisdictional levels, really, really cool. If you are interested in a heat map, please email the Center of Excellence at alz.org and they'll make sure that you get the files that you want. Next slide. 
I mentioned that we launched our Healthy Brain Resource Center. I keep sharing this with you because everybody who's watching us has the opportunity to submit um, materials for inclusion in the Resource Center. So um, these slides will be available. So we would love to have your materials included. Um, all the materials do go through a review and vetting process before they are included in the HBRC. Uh, for them to be included, they must be free or, or really, really close to free. Next slide. A couple publications that I wanted to share with you. Um, some of the work that we started with the University of Washington, what they were doing is they took the Gerontological Association's KAER model, the Kickstart, Assess, Evaluate, and Refer, and they're looking at um, implementing, they actually have been implementing the past year or so, that model within the University of Washington Health System. So one of our first papers was out. Um, I encourage you to check it out. Next slide, please. Then our bold center of excellence on dementia caregiving had a really neat paper that just came out in Alzheimer's and dementia, um, looking at the intersection of social determinants of health and family care, um, really pointing out some of the overlap and some of the need, as well as how this really is a public health issue where we all can work together to make a collective impact. Next slide, please. I pointed out our Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap Series. You can see our latest roadmap, which we introduced to you in July. Um, we have, next slide, please. We have new materials um, that have been developed to help support this uh, roadmap. So on the left here, you see our issue maps. So if you don't wanna read that whole beautiful thick book to go through those roadmap actions, we have, we have condensed it for you. So we have five issue maps on various different topics. They point out in those, they're just a, a, a two-pager. They point out for you the facts. They point out the roadmap actions. They point out for you why this is an important topic or issue for you to undertake. And then there's a case study included with that. Um, so those are brand new. I just got to touch them last week for the first time. The other very new product I want to share with you is the implementation guide. So if you're interested in implementing some actions or some of the roadmap activities, this guide is designed for you to start thinking through. Um, and these materials are available on our website and they're available on the Alzheimer's Association website as well too. Next slide. I wanna share with you a really neat toolkit that our Bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving did. Um, and it really nicely interfaces with our roadmap. So what they did is they looked at the specific roadmap actions and they looked at them in relation to caregiving. And so they, they, they took each of those roadmap actions and they're also looking at specific activities that you could undertake with those and also some language that they have found in other state and jurisdictional plans. Next slide. Another great opportunity available for you. So I'll pause for a second so you can all get a picture of that QR code. Um, applications are due November 15th and this is where you or someone from your health department can become a roadmap strategist. So what this roadmap strategist program does is it's really helping to build local public health capacity to, to address brain health. So this is not only a CDC partnership, but it's also a partnership with NACHO. So it's really getting at that public health from a local perspective. And, and it's really neat to see the kinds of things and activities that our previous strategists have done. And those states that you see highlighted in dark purple, that's where we've had previous roadmap strategists. Next slide, please. I mentioned that we're getting ready to kick off our roadmap for Indian Country Revision. So here is our aggressive timeline. I'll be sharing updates with you each quarter. Um, and we will also be reaching out at, at points too to get your input. And so you can share with us um, our, your thoughts on things that we've developed so far or things that you think we should include in this new roadmap. Next slide. 
Okay, one of the big things that we've been working on at CDC, uh, you know, we saw we're in the chronic disease center. So what we're trying to do is we're wanting to integrate brain health messaging into chronic existing chronic disease programs. Um, Jeff, very early on in our presentation, said what's good for your brain is good for your heart. I liked his small modification on that phrasing. Uh, but we have a series of rack cards talking about various kinds of things that you can do um, to help with brain health that's consistent with other chronic disease messaging. These are free, downloadable. Um, the URL here goes to the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. Um, they get them up as quickly as they can. Ours are a little delayed. But some of these rack cards are customizable. Um, as in, you can put your graphics on them, you can put your logos on them. The key is to get them out there and get them used. Next slide. And then we have a great new partnership um, with NAC, which is the National Association of Community Health Centers. Um, I'm showing you this page because they just launched their page on brain health. I would encourage you to check out some of the work that they have done. Learn more about NACA as an organization. It's amazing how many, how much health care they provide across the U.S. And so it's really an important audience, I think, for many of us to think about and to think about some of the ways that they can help drive the impact that we want to make. Next slide. That's it for me. So thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to share our great work at CDC. Thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, wrapping up, we have Sarah Fontaine with um, DOD, and then we'll have Rebecca Farrell from NSF. Um, Sarah? All right, my video is starting. Unclear if it's showing or not yet. Um, but I just wanted to go ahead and um, I can do this in five minutes or less, I promise. So. Um, within the Department of Defense, uh, we have the Defense Health Agency, and um, that is where CDMRP, or the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs, live. So this is actually an organization of 35 different programs, and they are, are each directed towards a specific disease or condition. Um, and we fund biomedical research, um, and we really do focus on sort of healthcare solutions, so looking for near-term impact. Um, and one of these is the peer-reviewed Alzheimer's research program. Now I had no um, say in the name um, and I will also awkwardly abbreviate it PRARP um, sometimes. So you'll just have to forgive me for the rest of the year for that. Um, so the program was started in um, 2011 and it serves to address Alzheimer's disease and other dementias following military service. So we're looking at military risk factors um, and that includes TBI, uh, and understanding why veterans have an increased incidence of um, Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. So to date, the PARP has funded 168 awards, totaling $147 million. Um, and now because it's October, I can actually talk to you about the awards that we just funded. So we just funded 16 awards um, and about three different topic areas. So we have, um, epidemiology awards, so looking more towards some of those risk factors and identifying some um, causes and some uh, symptom groups that, that may be unique to a military population. Um, we also do invest heavily in biomarker validation, and um, we are really interested in improving diagnosis now. So that includes not just the technologies or methodologies, but also including access to diagno diagnosis and understanding what is needed to um, move some of those early diagnostics into a um, affordable at home prognostic um, monitoring. And so we have a couple of uh, awards in that, in that area that are really promising. And hopefully within the next couple of years, I'll be able to um, even hopefully show you a prototype of one of those, which would be great. Um, we also support early career investigators. So we made three awards um, to early career investigators where they are the named sole PI. Um, and we have uh, awards in everything from um, interventions um, for caregiver support, um, individual quality of life support, um, all the way through to um, some uh, prospective studies looking at um, 
how some of these diagnostics really work. We have a focus on diversity um, and we're trying to make sure that we are gathering data in our research that will help us um, really support our service members, um, all of them who are just pretty selflessly uh, doing a lot of things that do enhance their risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we want to make sure that we have the data to help them um, with manage their brain health long term. Um, so unlike a lot of other agencies, um, I have a pretty strict uh, sort of set of ref left and right boundaries. So really only in the research um, space, but really happy um, to help with that. And the last thing that I want to add about um, CDMRP, which is honestly my favorite thing about it, is that in addition to um, requiring that all of the clinical research that the um, PARP funds has a lived experience consultant or community advisory board or community collaboration of some description. We also include people with lived experience in not just the peer review, but also our funding decision making. And so they're involved at all stages within our research. Um, and that is all happy to take any questions in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And last but certainly not least, um, Rebecca Farrell from NSF. Thanks, Helen. Uh, as Helen said, I'm Rebecca Farrell. I'm a program director at the National Science Foundation, and I'm the NSF federal representative to this advisory committee. So NSF has a very broad mission. Um, we are an independent federal agency that was formed in 1950, and the mission is to support fundamental research in all areas of science and engineering. As such, we have eight research directorates spanning biology, computer science, engineering, math and physical science, technology, innovation and partnerships, geology, education, and my own directorate, social, behavioral, and economic sciences. NSF often partners with other agencies and organizations to make connections between the fundamental research that we support and societal applications. A couple of examples, we uh, often co-fund in common areas of interest with other organizations, such as our program Smart and Connected Health, which we uh, co-fund with NIH. And we've also started a program called Intern that provides non-academic internship opportunities for our next generation of scientists. So in terms of dementia research, given our broad mission, we do not have a specific program de dedicated to dementia research, but when you look across all of our directorates, we do have a portfolio of relevant research. There are nearly 500 awards that have been made since 2012, totaling over $200 million related either directly or indirectly to dementia research. And you can see those search terms and uh, in further information in the bottom right. Um, I'm not gonna read through our lists here, but these projects, which come again from a bunch of different directorates, span research on underlying biology related to, to dementia, um, diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's and related dementias, and also, research on improving quality of life for patients and their caregivers. As you can see in those lists below. And then just um, very briefly, uh, some new examples that I've listed at the bottom of the slide um, coming from various directorates from technology, innovation and partnerships. We have a small business award where someone is developing a new method to identify Alzheimer's through saliva. We have people making new mathematical models to describe the progression of amyloid, beta, and tau protein pathology. Um, we have computer scientists who are working on artificial intelligence and ways to create AI systems that are uh, really truly intelligent and can aid the quality of life and aid people who are suffering from conditions, um, chronic conditions, including things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And then from engineering, um, we have folks who are looking at the, the underlying fundamental mechanical properties of brain tissue and how that may relate to understanding differences between healthy and diseased tissues. So NSF has this broad portfolio um, and we're definitely interested in partnering with other groups in areas of common interest. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And thanks to all of our federal colleagues who um, 
spoke today. I know it was a lot, but if you can believe it, it's only a small part of all of the work that they are doing and their agencies are doing um, to further the mission of Napa, to further our national plan, and to support people with dementia um, more broadly throughout the government. So um, thanks to our feds and to our new members. You'll get to know them a little bit more uh, as we get into the subcommittee work. Um, I think we do not have time for for questions. So if you have questions, please feel free to stick them in the chat or to email them, but rather we're going to turn straight to public comments. Um, and thanks very much to our public commenters for their patience um, today. So we have five public commenters. We might go slightly over the 4.30 stop time, but I ask everyone to um, respect the time that they've put into formulating their public comments. And if you can stay on, please do. Our first public comment is from Sue Peshen from the Alliance for Aging Research. Sue? Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> uh, my name is Sue Peshen, and I serve as president and CEO of the Alliance for Aging Research. Uh, the Alliance supports CMS's efforts to promote appropriate nursing home staffing levels. However, given the ongoing long-term care hiring crisis, this seems like the right prescription at the wrong time. Um, additionally, we're asking the agency to please stop conflating staffing issues with inappropriate use of antipsychotics. CMS needs to take immediate action to fix the agency's outdated antipsychotic quality measures, which create incentives for misdiagnosis and prevent patient-centered care uh, grounded in clinical standards. The reality is that neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia often require medical attention. Long-term care providers are trained to start with non-pharmacologic approaches. If these become ineffective, residents who would benefit from medical treatment deserve to have a federal policy that ensures access to FDA-approved options to help combat extreme agitation, delusions, and potential harm to the beneficiary, their family, caregivers, and staff. And importantly, nursing home medical staff should be able to prescribe without fear of negative rating ramifications for their facilities. The current metrics fail to capture data on crucial points, such as the number of residents who are involuntarily kicked out because facilities are directed against medically treating residents who are struggling. Extensive research work commissioned by ASPE in September of last year on nursing home initiated involuntary discharge Discharges found that behavioral symptoms and psychiatric and mood disorders are the most prominent risk factors for live discharge. So we're going to be a nation filled with homeless people living with dementia if these policies don't change. For the past three years, Project PAUSE member organizations representing long-term care nurses, medical directors, pharmacists, geriatric psychiatrists, family caregivers, and older adults have urged CMS officials to update these measures. We've reasonably asked them to require documentation of the what, why, and how a medication is being prescribed. The agency has taken zero accountability and our pleas have been ignored. The current staffing crisis in nursing homes will require a more nuanced approach in which CMS considers the real world impact on patient access to appropriate care, the overall impact on nursing staff and the real world consequences of outdated metrics that have failed beneficiaries, families, and nursing home workers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sue. Our next comment is from Jessica Copeland. Yeah, good afternoon. So I'm Dr. Jessica Copeland, and I'm speaking on behalf of the National Center for Health Research, which is a nonprofit public health think tank. And as you all know, dementia is a very devastating and yet common condition, but it is also very misunderstood. And that's why the National Center for Health Research encourages the advisory committee to develop an advocacy campaign to help educate the public to reduce these misunderstandings. The symptoms of dementia and cognitive impairment can be inappropriately diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease, even though cognitive impairment can have many different causes. Working to reduce misunderstandings about dementia and cognitive impairment could be enormously helpful to individuals and their families by helping to reduce unnecessary fear and anxiety while also preventing unnecessary medical treatment. The health of individuals, families, private insurance, and the welfare of governmental health programs are at stake. Dementia and mild cognitive impairment can have many causes and does not mean that a person has or will necessarily develop Alzheimer's disease. The National Center for Health Research encourages the advisory committee to help educate the public about the preventable causes of cognitive impairment, including 
and the side effects from benzodiazepines, sleep medications, and allergy pills, advocacy regarding the impact that social isolation and lack of physical activity can have on cognitive impairment is also critical to help reduce misunderstandings and encourage change that may drastically reduce or reverse cognitive symptoms. And thank you, that's my public comment, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we have Michael Raffi. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Raffi. I'm a professor of neurology at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Thank you again for allowing me to speak today. As you may know, people with Down syndrome are living longer, healthier, and more independent lives. With the fastest growing segment of this population being those over the age of 50. With this increase in life expectancy, however, we are seeing more people with Down syndrome being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, which is now the leading cause of death in adults over the age of 35. Over the past decade, we've discovered a great deal about the biology as to why people with Down syndrome are at site such high risk for Alzheimer's disease. The gene for the amyloid precursor protein, or APP, resides on the 21st chromosome, which in people with Down syndrome leads to an overproduction of APP, leading to amyloid plaques and subsequently Alzheimer's disease dementia. There are individuals with Down syndrome who have a partial trisomy. That is, although they have an extra copy of chromosome 21, they do not have an extra copy of that APP gene. These individuals do not develop amyloid plaques and they do not develop Alzheimer's disease dementia. At the same time, remarkable progress is being made in the Alzheimer's field. Results from randomized placebo controlled trials in the general population have shown that by removing amyloid plaques, we can slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. But despite their high risk, people with Down syndrome have been excluded from these clinical trials which leaves the safety of these new treatments largely unknown in this vulnerable population. In just the past five years, we have made significant strides in understanding Alzheimer's disease biomarkers in people with Down syndrome. Many of these discoveries are due in no small part to the TRANS-NIH INCLUDE initiative, which encourages the inclusion of people with Down syndrome into ongoing research efforts. The INCLUDE initiative has helped launch several groundbreaking studies, the Trial Ready Cohort for Down Syndrome, or TRAC-DS, has enrolled nearly 200 participants who will enter clinical trials designed specifically for them. This project is being conducted by the Alzheimer's Clinical Trials Consortium Down Syndrome, which has leveraged the NIA's clinical trial infrastructure to establish an international network of expert sites that serve as a platform for testing the most promising treatments safely and effectively. There is much work to be done, but through collaboration with advocacy groups, inclusion in the NAPA roadmap, and with sustained funding and support, we will succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Our next public comment is from Susan Eisler. Susan? Okay, am I there? We can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, thank you. And thank you all for your comments and everything today. It's amazing how much, how much has changed in the last few years, how much information there is. Today, uh, I am a volunteer ambassador for the Association of Frontotemporal Degeneration. And my husband had the behavioral variant of frontotemporal degeneration at 50 and died at age 60. My son had it at 50 and died at age 53. And uh, one of the problems with frontotemporal degeneration is that it doesn't affect older people. It doesn't affect memory. It's judgment and behavior. Sorry. It's judgment and behavior and executive function. So a person with this disease doesn't look sick. They walk, they walk in the community. People think they're normal. Their primary care physician may think they're normal, but they, but they have difficulties. And so as we get closer to a cure, as we get closer to intervention, it's so important for the public to be aware that this is a possibility. And for the primary care physicians and the people who deal with the public to be aware that this is a possibility. So I, I just wanna to bring to the attention that that's still a big problem. We, we work on it, but it's still a huge problem. 
Um, the only, uh, the other things I will say is that when, when the people were talking about interventions earlier that are available, um, th there is a huge uh, population of frontotemporal degeneration people who have a genetic variant, and they would be very eager to uh, in, engage in interventions, very interested since there's no cure yet, and that's a population that people can look to for trials and whatever. And I also want to say, especially looking at all the uh, information that came out today, this is a problem for the normal caregiver out there. There's so much information, so many agencies, so much going on that I think we all have to be aware of how we can make this accessible to the average person on the street who all of a sudden finds themselves in this situation. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Um, our last comment is from Hassan Shah. Hassan? Uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, good afternoon, members of the Advisory Council. Uh, congratulations on your role on, on this committee and in this group. Uh, my name is Hassan Shah, and I have the fortune and honor of representing the National Down Syndrome Society as their Director of Advocacy and Policy. I would like to respectfully express my sincere disappointment for the ongoing absence of representation from the Down Syndrome community on the advice, NAPA Advisory Council. This is further reflected in the 2023 recommendations where Down syndrome is seemingly listed tangentially, given the alarming statistics that over 90% of individuals with Down syndrome develop Alzheimer's disease. It is vital that this community be given a voice at the table to address the unique challenges they face, which in turn can add to the ongoing and needed growing body of Alzheimer's research. In the following comments, I will outline the pressing need for such representation and offer recommendations on how to bridge this gap. The Down syndrome community's relationship with Alzheimer's disease is an urgent concern that cannot be overlooked. Not only do individuals with Down syndrome have significantly higher chances of developing Alzheimer's disease than the general population, but Alzheimer's has also become the leading cause of death for adults within this community. These disturbing statistics underscore, underscore the dire need for the advisory council to not only keep Down syndrome top of mind in its annual plan recommendations as, as mandated by NAPA, but also include someone from the community on the council. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Uh, to address this issue comprehensively, I strongly, I strongly reiterate past comments of my colleagues and urge the advisory council to establish a dedicated subcommittee this subcommittee would focus on improving diagnostic and clinical support for adults with Down syndrome and intellectual and developmental disabilities, aiming to provide targeted solutions that are intentionally and intentionally inclusive for individuals who cannot access these programs without modifications. Until the advisory committee has representation from the Down syndrome community, the subcommittee could establish a process to integrate thinking and consideration of the impact of Alzheimer's disease on the Down syndrome community for the advisory council. The subcommittee's mission would encompass several key areas we highlighted in our letter to the advisory committee back in 2021. For the sake of brevity, and I know we're getting past the 430 mark, I'm just going to quickly list those key, uh, key areas but I have additional details in my written comments that I'll submit tomorrow. Uh, those areas include access to adequate clinical care, increased support for research, access to new, new Alzheimer's treatment, inclusion in clinical trials, access to long-term services and supports. As you already heard, Dr. Michael Raffi, he highlighted the significant risk individuals with Down syndrome face regarding Alzheimer's disease and the biological reason for, for it. Because of these factors, inclusion in clinical trials and equitable access to treatment are equally essential. We believe that the addressing these concerns necessitates the creation of a special subcommittee with the NAPA Advisory Council, uh, Council focusing on intellectual and developmental disabilities, including Down syndrome. Such a subcommittee would not only serve as a beacon of hope for the Down syndrome community, providing them with advocacy and support they deserve, but also play a critical role in, in and research progress on Alzheimer's. In conclusion, I urge the NAPA Advisory Com 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 Council to act swiftly and decisively to address the urgent needs of the Down syndrome community regarding Alzheimer's disease. The time for research equity and improved access to care is now. Let us work together to ensure that no individual is left behind, that everyone has a fair chance at healthy and fulfilling life, and that Alzheimer's and that Alzheimer's disease in the Down syndrome community is a challenge we are determined to conquer together. 
As a starting point, I would encourage you to include the work uh, of the INCLUDE project, investigation of co-occurring conditions across the life, lifespan of under, <laughs> lifespan to understand Down syndrome. Um, this directive called for a new trans NIH research initiative on critical health and quality of life needs for individuals with Down syndrome and asked the project to lead to provide assistance in coordinating the subcommittee. Thank you for your uh, time and consideration because I am sweating. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Only friends here. Um, uh, thank you to all of our public commenters um, for taking the time and for staying a few minutes late today. And with that, I will turn it back over to Adrian. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. We had a phenomenal discussion today on risk reduction with take-home messages about blood pressure control. Uh, we learned about the importance of hearing, multi-lifestyle interventions, culturally sensitive adaptations, and the importance of raising public awareness. It was uh, very exciting to hear the wealth of information from our federal partners of the work that has been done over the years to support the, the work of NAPA, and some more specifically our public commenters about the information regarding the importance of looking at the quality measures for antipsychotic use, um, and, and just <clears throat> educating the public uh, about the misunderstandings regarding cognitive impairment, um, the prevalence and challenges with Down syndrome, having Alzheimer's disease, and frontotemporal degeneration and the need for increased public awareness. We really appreciate the time that everyone has given today. Our next meeting will be on January 23rd, and more information will be um, provided for that. Those who are new members, we will be having an orientation session. So thank you all for joining today. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.